If you've been a member of this channel for any amount of time, you've known that I spent a pretty sizable amount of time in Thailand as it's one of the best countries in the world in my personal opinion. I lived there for a year and my intention is to continue living there once I'm leaving Canada. And I know this is confusing, but I don't live in Canada. I'm just staying here momentarily. I'm actually from the United States, but moral of the story, I love Thailand. It's also where Coach Adam is, one of my best friends and also my business associate. He is truly one of the coolest people I've ever met smartest people I've ever met and uh, he actually just got his girlfriend a pro card which is huge so congratulations to those two in collecting their IFBB pro card if you're actually interested in working with them he does actually coach through blood built coaching so you can click the link down below and figure that out and also is where a ton of other bodybuilders semi permanently or permanently reside due to great lifestyle there for example vigorous Steve Dr. Mike I mean myself being there his team residence periodization has multiple times I mean on multiple occasions visited there. I mean, we all know Ziz, he died of a heart attack in the sauna, speculatively induced by a combination of PEDs and party drugs. That happened right in Pattaya, Thailand, which not a lot of people know. It's kind of interesting how many people die in Pattaya, Thailand, but another story for another day. And I'm sure we all remember, I mean, you can't forget he was an amazing guy, Joe Ligner, rest in peace. He passed away in Pattaya as well. One of the best influencers, I think, that was in Pattaya, Thailand or Thailand at large. Joe was also one to talk a lot about his experiences in Thailand and amongst others contribute to the widespread belief that Thailand might just be one of the best, if not the best countries to bodybuild in and start a business. And you might be asking yourself, well, Colton, I don't really understand what you're talking about. Why is Thailand so effective and great for bodybuilders and entrepreneurs? Well, let me enlighten you. For starters, there's obvious things like steroids are completely legal and you can just waltz up to your local pharmacy and buy just about any product you need for dollars compared to, well, dozens of dollars. And not only that, but the pharmacist will be happy to give you any kind of professional advice that you'd like. Much better than how we do it in America, where you're buying something from somebody's bathtub and who knows how the fuck to use this shit, you just buy it. Oh, also, the nice thing is that the gear is pharma great. There is true rear bear remobolin to Stevirin from bear products as well and all sorts of shit. You usually don't want to buy UGL from Thailand because that is probably fake. But real talk, it's so cost effective to buy pharma grade, you might as well just do it. But I'm literally talking a situation where you waltz up with a couple bucks in your pocket to a local pharmacy and you get ARBs, testoviron, remobolin, growth hormone. I mean, truly anything that you need for dollars, like not, you know, hundreds of dollars, dollars. No questions asked, nobody giving you a weird eyebrow. It's just there. But that's not the only thing that's cheap. The next best fact about Thailand and why it is such a great place for inspiring entrepreneurs is that everything is cheap. What you usually be paying for for a week in terms of rent within the US is what you would get a month for rent in Thailand. And this wouldn't be some shitty condo with a one bedroom. This would be an entire villa with three bedrooms, a pool, and a maid to come with it. In my instance, I paid 800 USD a month for two kitchen in it, one house with two kitchens, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a maid, a full pool, a full driveway, and literally everything else you could ask for. Food is also pennies on the dollar. It cost me the equivalent of one dollar USD to buy one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of chicken breast. Likewise with beef, it is the cheapest place to live in the world, or well, used to be, it's not really anymore, but still very cost effective. There are a few other aspects in which the cost won't vary much compared to other countries like the US, but all in all, you can live a very, very comfortable life for just a few thousand dollars a month, which is still a major contrast to places like the United States and Canada, for instance. I mean, if you made $2,000 a month in America, you're shit out of luck. You couldn't even afford housing most likely. But in Thailand, $2,000 a month, you can live a very fucking good life. And it doesn't just end there. A lot of people come because of the warm weather, fortunately, because they like the women. And that's a whole topic in and of itself to potentially get away with murder <laughs> or just because they like the culture or <laughs> something like that. Sorry, cap. So as you can imagine, from the picture that I'm painting, it gives you a very free lifestyle as a bodybuilder or an entrepreneur who's looking to really expand their horizons and focus on building something seriously. And unfortunately, this doesn't just mean good people come to Thailand with really good intentions and not sort of the colonizing tensions that a lot of other white men have when they go to Thailand. It creates such a bad reputation for foreigners in Thailand. We, we're called Farangs. It's like a derogative term 
term in, in Thai. And it sucks because there are a lot of asshats who go to Thailand and think they're the shit because they make more money than the locals. They can pick up any woman. Facts are that those women don't give a shit about you. They just care about your wallet. Also, people don't care about you. And soon, usually those people will end up in a corner of a aisle somewhere in a random city, completely dead, decapitated, or they'll be found in the ocean a few days later. It's really a great place because it handles the asshats very well. Usually, if uh, someone's speeding around on their, their motorbike too fast because they're a foreigner and they think they're the shit, well, you, you won't see them again. <laughs> They'll be gone by the next week. It's a great place. Okay. The uh, citizens handle shit themselves, which I love. And you'll even see in a lot of comments on social media that Thailand houses the weirdest dudes in the American culture ever, or just any culture. I mean, more often than not, they're just going for the sex scene. They're doing sex tourism, which is what Thailand is specifically notorious for. And if it's not that, it's just the rest of them trying to do what the internet calls passport bros. But today's video isn't about us having a bad reputation with the Thais. It's actually about one bodybuilder who's built his entire personality upon being a bodybuilder in Thailand. And he actually happens to have a pretty poor reputation amongst the other bodybuilders in Thailand. Now you're probably asking, who is this guy? I just talked about Thailand for like an hour. So where is he coming to relevancy? Well, his name on social media is Dan, the bodybuilder, hold on, in Thailand. I'm not kidding. That's his entire personality on social media. But the strange thing is, considering that his whole embodiment is being a bodybuilder in Thailand and trying to produce internet content for people to consume, how many people really know who he is. He's kind of like a fragment of bodybuilding lore that only a niche group of people will ever be graced to discover. Because he really only gets a couple hundred views on his videos if he's lucky. But maybe graced isn't the right words because, well, his advice and personality as soon as you see it is very questionable to say the least. So without further ado, let me just briefly explain the story of Dan, the bodybuilder in Thailand. Okay, hey everybody, this is Dan from bodybuilderinthailand.com. One of the first videos that Dan had posted on his personal channel is one titled Bodybuilder in Thailand, How I Ended Up Living Here. This video is going to play a key role in understanding Dan's story, as he doesn't really do a whole lot of explaining his past in the rest of his social media presence. He doesn't really have an about section on YouTube or Instagram or any prior videos explaining the sequence of events that led to him ending up where he is now. If we dig into the video, Dan talks a lot about the sort of blue pill lifestyle, escaping the matrix, sort of like we've seen as a blueprint in many alpha males within the industry. He was notoriously working between retail stores and fast food joints, trying to make a quick buck. And he felt really alienated from his own personal identity from doing this. I worked some jobs that were like normal jobs when I was like in high school. And when I was in community college, before I went to University of California, I worked at Hollister, folding the clothes, you know, Hollister clothing, got a lot of girls. And and then uh, I worked at in and out Burger later and got a repetitive motion injury that really fucked me up and, and really made me lose all my gains because I wasn't able to exercise at all for one year because uh, the potato machine, repetitive motion. <laughs> it's actually a humbling story because a lot of, honestly relate with it. He felt like he was living a very robotic lifestyle, even going as far to mentioning suffering a repetitive motion injury from working at in and out you know, the burger place that everyone likes in America. I, kind of think it's shit, but that's it. He went on to get a degree in psychology simply because he found it interesting and not because he could envision a career in the field or going on to do anything important. But later he said that he hated the idea of sitting in an office all day and working for someone else, being paid to literally die slowly over time. Basically, this video covers how Dan didn't want to live his life monotonously. He didn't want to do the same thing day in and day out just to make a couple bucks. And again, I totally agree because many people go down the traditional route of living a life to just simply show up at work for eight hours a day and then have maybe six hours to themselves and then slowly pass away, to be honest with you, while hoping that they've built a retirement by the end of it. And then by the time you are actually able to retire, which the average age in America is about 67 years old of retirement, you're too fragile and impaired to do anything at all or to go traveling all around the world. I mean, there's even plane ride restrictions due to DVT risks that you literally can't take. Like you can't travel internationally at a certain age due to the risk of dying 
like being so high. And all of this was just to get paid 12, 15, $30 an hour for your time. I mean, that's kind of crazy. I spend more than that on a dinner. There's literally at some point, no opportunity to improve on your life at your own will, unless you've struck some really good luck. No matter how hard you work, your work will always be basically a price tag. And I agree that it's not necessarily fair, but for an average person, that is really all they can comprehend doing. And unfortunately, it's somewhat a necessary evil to keep the world running. I mean, you can either risk losing employment, which is one thing, or you can risk your own business going under and ending up bankrupt. It's a choose your kind of hard situation. And I think a lot of people do favor the entrepreneurship choice, but just don't know how to go about it or aren't in the right environment to support it. But Dan and I have simply opted for maybe the little bit of a harder route, thus how he got into Thailand. And as you just saw, Dan continues talking a little bit about his timeline of events, though he actually goes into a little bit more depth about how he actually earns his income online, which allows him to stay on his feet financially while in Thailand. Anyways, back to me and what I was doing before I came to Thailand. I was having anxiety and I started like looking uh, online, you know, I knew that you could make money online. So there's this website called afalongabroad.com, afalongabroad.com. And that was the first time that I was exposed to you can leave your country and you can live somewhere else and you can make money on the internet? So I know this guy now. We actually became friends here in Thailand. He was doing marketing on there to advertise that, you know, what he was doing in his website. And, and that really had a huge psychological impact on me seeing this. Amongst more articles, Dan goes into covering some topics regarding corporate hate. The first article Dan really uses to cover his experiences with making an online income is this one here. In this article published in 2016, Dan discusses how he metaphorically popped his cherry, quote unquote, in context of an online income. He describes his jealousy of the great deals his brothers in law seem to have constantly gotten by using the platform eBay and decided that there was an opportunity to take advantage of for him. Dan seemed to express quite a bit of interest in guitars, and during his time, he describes the poor marketing efforts of other auctioneers seem to make on their other offers, and after doing some data analysis, he realized that he could turn a profit flipping these guitars with some better marketing and his niche product knowledge. Dan later on exposes he was only making a few hundred dollars week to week between flipping these deals with guitars, but this was still proof of concept for him. He was able to make money online and establish a sort of presence for himself, which made him feel successful and obviously rewarded for his work. Compared to when he was just flipping burgers at a fast food chain, he was now in control of the amplitude of income he could make. But whilst this was a rewarding experience, it wasn't necessarily one that had set him free. This was just the beginning. So with Dan's recent experience in establishing somewhat of a hobby business online, he took one lesson he'd learned and gone into his next venture. That lesson being to take whatever you're highly experienced or knowledgeable in and then leverage it for money. Overall, that's actually a very solid piece of advice until you realize what his next venture was actually going to be. Before providing any kind of context about what the business actually was, we need to understand that, again, the whole concept of Dan's belief is that you have to leverage what you already know to build some kind of revenue. Now, you might see where this is going because Dan started to become an affiliate marketer, essentially being somewhat of a salesperson for some other companies, yet still being his own separate entity as a form of consultant. It was a pretty decent business model and it may have worked for a while. But it turns out the market that Dan was in was selling Kratom, a medical plant used to create some rather interesting effects and somewhat highly addictive. You see, Kratom is said to be beneficial for its opioid and stimulant-like properties. That alone should tell you it's quite a potent form of, well, herbal remedy. It's a plant that is native to Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and a few others, and is also a distant relative to the coffee tree. This supports the fact that it allegedly provides similar stimulative properties comparable to caffeine, but it also has a strong painkiller effect. Allegedly, it also has nootropic benefits, meaning it may support cognitive function and memory, and still contradictory to this point, can also aid in relaxation and reducing social jitters, which I guess it just depends on the strain of product. But despite all of these benefits, many medical resources, and even the 
the FDA proposed that the substance is quite unsafe due to its history of causing painful abdominal side effects, cardiovascular issues, liver damage, nausea, trouble breathing, and even hallucinations to just leave you with a few things on the list. And so with all of that said, it's very clear that the FDA never really approved of this for human use. And it's also considered a drug of concern by the DEA, meaning that if they ever decide to make it illegal, it'll be a very quick process. Oh, it also can't be marketed legally as a dietary supplement within the United States, despite what some people think of it being quite similar to ashwagandha. But to make this matter worse, Kratom is actually considered an illegal supplement in 16 countries, namely Australia, New Zealand, Italy, and Turkey, amongst many other European countries as well. And there's a few states within the United States that have banned it outright altogether. So if you're taking this all into consideration, it might not be the best thing to be using, and especially not the thing you might want to be marketing as it could land you in some legal troubles or at worst have your business go under. But Dan started to consider himself the Kratom guru, as someone who's extensively used the substance himself, proclaiming could yield significant benefits to many others, including his friends and family, so much so that he argues that the substance has potential to save lives. It's interesting because we've heard many other people within this small niche of friends say similar things about SARMs, for instance, Dr. Tony Huge in reference. Now, although we've covered it all together, I'm sure you can see that the life-changing potential is likely not for the better. And Dan realized that too. I'm not entirely sure, but the website he once claimed was the number one Kratom database doesn't exist anymore, so I actually don't know. But if you continue to read his articles, he continues to regurgitate trying to sell the affiliate marketing dream, profiting off domain hosting and much more. Now, I'm not saying this is entirely an immoral thing to host a domain and profit off affiliate marketing or whatever, but it really does seem that this guy was primarily making money off of this kind of schemey thing at the time, basically just selling a dream to another person, then buying it up and, I don't know, making money off of this essentially. But for now, I think it's important to dive into the dishonesty of Dan the bodybuilder in Thailand's writings, because in the next few articles, he decides to to begin talking about becoming a successful YouTuber, specifically covering YouTube SEO, or search engine optimization, as a means of building your subscriber count and views. In this article, Dan attempts to teach us about certain concepts like metadata, backlinking, and keywords, all of which seem to be explained in a pretty generic context, which could very well just be him paraphrasing what other people had said and essentially just parroting whatever he heard. Because in the same article, Dan claims that he's ranking in the top few of certain people PED keywords. Even though his article is seven years old, today his channel isn't even displayed in search for these terms at all, despite there being videos over eight years old placing very high in search with those same keywords that aren't Dan's channel. I mean, if that wasn't enough, if we just head over to his videos and sort by popular, his most successful video has only broken a few, basically 10,000 views, and of those, none of them were related to steroids at all, which he claimed to know the SEO optimization for. And in recent years, he struggled to even get a thousand views. And the fact that his subscriber content is only sitting under 6,000 after, again, almost a decade of doing this and claiming to be a search engine optimization guru, well, it really just does seem like the claims are coming out from his ass. And I'm no expert either. Trust me, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. I'm just talking on camera and thankfully it's gaining some attention. Thank you guys, by the way. But I'm certainly not running around claiming that I know the secrets to success or I have any keys that you simply don't have. I just offer my advice in the form of my own experiences, and that's typically it. And this, to me, when someone's coming off as an authority, when they don't simply have the accolades to show that they are the authority, is kind of scammy. And the guy honestly just struggles at large to even keep a consistent posting schedule. Some videos are months apart, if not years apart. And at this point, they've turned into all bodybuilding-related things to now just kind of vlogs of him going about a really awkward day. <laughs> he also hasn't made a post on his website for over five years, and his Instagram tells us basically buttfuck nothing, with his most recent post being in January of his train to Laos, which he didn't follow up with on YouTube until just last month. And so it kind of seems from a couple of years ago that he stopped really caring about the business side of things, and from what he still posts on YouTube, he isn't living a super luxurious life either. So there's a chance he's actually not really earning an online income at all anymore, or simply earning local wages in the countries that he travels to. And don't get me wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. He's earned his freedom and gets to do what most people wish they could do. But Dan's story doesn't end there. Despite Dan going to the route of claiming to be some kind of YouTube guru, the most coverage the guy ever got was actually on Nick Strength and Power's 
channel, which if you're not aware is essentially one of the, if not the number one place on YouTube to get news within the bodybuilding industry. So if you end up on his channel, you'd hopefully think it's for a good reason. But unfortunately though, geez, this wasn't for the case of Dan. You see, in Nick's video released roughly five years ago, he was covering an incident that Dan had at the time recently brought to light. Dan was suffering some form of extremely violent necrotic infection in his quad, which he claimed was due to injecting infected quote unquote gear or steroids. And this is what I mentioned at the beginning of the video when I said it's a terrible idea to buy non-pharma grade products from sketchy Thai pharmacies. Because in Nick's video, also referencing John Bravo in his post, addressing similar concerns, Dan was also a close associate of Tony Huge and potentially a business partner as we can see a handful of videos with his company Enhanced Athlete in the title. Now, if you're not familiar with Tony Huge, I've done a ton of videos on the guy and his history as well, and he's just simply not a good person. He talks about a lot of experimental drug protocols, try to really embellish them to be something that they're not, saying that they can cure cancer and people's lifespans will improve using certain pharmaceuticals, and truly he has no backing to that. He's not an actual doctor, for instance, and he just subjects people to horrible misinformation. He's also done some pretty questionable things, as an alleged murder is under his name as well, and the FBI is investigating for it. He hosts a house full of prostitutes that he has to pay for, and he owns a company called, again, Enhanced Athletes and several more that sell highly questionable products that are very likely illegal to be selling, but he goes through some gray loopholes to be able to sell them. And when I say he's into like experimental behaviors, I don't mean the kind of experimental behaviors we've talked about or talked about before on this channel. The experimentation here isn't like Chase Irons or Vigorous Steve. It's much worse in the fact that there's no clinical research behind anything he's doing and the experimentation is just frankly his own word being given to people and then him doing the experiments on the people. Kind of like Dr. Mundo. There are many scenes of him on YouTube that just look like straight up scenes out of Breaking Bad with him manufacturing some kind of potion in his lab. And there is quite a risk of doing all this stuff on your own in terms of safety and sterility of the products. The chance that you're able to keep a sterile environment without actually having, well, experience of doing so. In the videos, you can see he's not wearing any protective gear, sterilizing the environment prior to mixing any of the things he's mixing. Uh, it, it's very likely that those products can become contaminated. And which leads a person to getting some drugs that are unfortunately going to have very deadly bacteria in them and thus when you inject those compounds usually intramuscularly there is going to be a radical infection that causes massive issues. Dan's channel suddenly just sort of ceased to exist after his leg incident. He stopped posting altogether. And I was only informed whilst writing this script by a few people that used to watch Dan's content that he actually did point the finger at Tony Huge for leaving him in Colombia with his leg all screwed up, allegedly, right? Tony Huge and him went to Columbia, some stuff happened, Tony left without him, his leg was infected, nearly dying, crazy stuff. And, and because of this, he did start a GoFundMe and tried to raise money. Initially, it was $10,000, and then suddenly $10,000 wasn't enough, which it was amazing he had capitalized on this issue that much, but he now needed $30,000. And in total, after the first GoFundMe had successfully met its goal, he made an additional $18,000, didn't quite get to his $30,000 goal, and it is speculated that he did did this completely fraudulently and this was just to put a couple bucks in his pocket because quite frankly when you're in these countries medical care is extremely cheap i had to get surgery on my foot because of muay thai and it was i think 40 bucks and it was one of the best experiences i've ever had in a hospital it's very unlikely that he needed this kind of money for any kind of surgery but we have gotten this far into the video with talking about someone who has bodybuilder in name and really haven't gone over any of their enhancement protocols which i'm sure you're interested in because of course he's supposed to be a subject matter expert, right? Well, Dan does delve into the enhancement side of things or steroid usage quite often, almost in every video where he's addressing something like this. He's also written dozens of articles about certain PEDs and how to use them. And he also has a book, which we'll tackle here shortly. Another thing that I did was I used uh, a lot of DHT derivatives and very harsh androgens. So a lot of testosterone, Anadrol, Trenbolone, a lot of Winstrol. That's a heavy steroid that I used. So Anadrol, Windstraw, Windstraw, Trenbolone, High Testosterone, Superdraw. These 
growth hormone. These are steroids that I've, I've used a lot of. I've used a lot of these, these uh, hormones and uh, those contributed to some uh, side effects that I have. Hopefully that short clip has given you a bit of an insight on what the kind of guy we're dealing with is. For those of you who are unaware, growth hormone is not a steroid. Yes, it can have physique enhancing effects, but objectively it's not a steroid. It's a peptide, a string of amino acids. And this guy seems to throw around fancy drug names like it makes him an expert. But let me tell you firsthand, knowing the terminology of the pharmacology is not necessarily making you a pharmacological expert. So let's just anyways, truly dig into the educational content of Dan the Bodybuilder in Thailand. All right, so first up we have the MK677 review and it looks like this was probably written while Dan was getting friendly with Tony Huge because it's endorsed by Tony Huge as he makes the product. For those of you who aren't aware, MK677, otherwise known as Ibutamorelin, is a ghrelin mimetic that really basically enhances growth hormone secretion. It's a growth hormone secretagogue. Put simply, it mimics the effect of hunger in your body to stimulate the release of growth hormone from your actual endogenous production. The key takeaways from that explanation are two things. The first being that this drug has the ability to make you very hungry. The second being that since it only modulates your endogenous growth hormone production, there's going to be a point where your body kind of reaches its production limit and increasing the dose is just going to yield more side effects versus benefits. So with that said, I've already kind of tackled Dan's first claim, which has no foundation, which is that the drug can stimulate massive increases to growth hormone and IGF-1. Because unlike growth hormone, just taking more of it won't really get you anything more and it will be a diminishing result sooner or later. Moving on, Dan then makes the claim that there are studies to prove that a 25 milligram daily dose of this drug will can increase your IGF-1 and growth hormone output by 189%. In other words, essentially doubling it. Now there are two takeaways to be had here. The first is the return on investment. Having a look here at Swiss Chems, which despite recently being considered a very unreliable drug source, seems to be quite the standard for how much these drugs sell for. Now they sell a total of 600 milligrams as 60 capsules of 10 milligrams for 70 USD. $70 for a bottle that's going to last you about three and a half weeks of the equivalent of basically four IUs of growth hormone in reference to the standard replacement dose of growth hormone being about two IUs. Uh, no need to get into detail, but if you're in the loop, you can know that it's probably cheaper to actually just run growth hormone at a higher dose. So why spend so much money on a subpar product that's not even going to get you equivalent results? Which leads me to our second takeaway. Dan never actually references any fucking studies that he's actually claiming to have read. In contrast, though, we do have a trial lasting 12 months in which after prolonged use, patients with serum IGF-1 had only elevated an extra 72%, which is a sizable amount, but it's not the result you're going to experience from using growth hormone exogenously. So this drug really isn't as spectacular as it seems. Sure, it's amazing if you want to feel hungry and you're trying to do a massing phase, but ultimately it's going to be inert beyond the use of growth hormone, as well as it's basically roughly going to be financially the same thing for you if you're investing in it. But don't worry, because if you're reading Dan's article, you can get a whopping 15% discount, making it more financially viable for you. He's not profiting off this at all, though. Trust me, it's just all for his fans. Anyway, moving on to the next article, we have one called How to Use Steroid Hormones. This one should be good. After Dan does a bit of rambling, tried to come across a bit witty, he pretty much comes to the straight point of the only way to achieve a body of your dreams is hard work. He says, you can literally use all the drugs you want, but performance dancing drugs are not going to make up for poor work ethic and shitty behaviors, which I actually 100% agree with. He continues to go on to throw the industry standard quote, which is, it's all 80% diet and 20% training, which when it comes to body composition in general is actually a, a pretty good rule of thumb. But this is where things just start to rapidly go downhill and precipitously take a turn. Because because Dan then proposes the hypothetical question, well, then what role do steroids play? And he says that they help you take it further with your diet and training. Now, whilst this is certainly true to a certain degree, more so when it comes to your diet, taking steroids just doesn't suddenly allow you to eat more or eat all you want. It's You're still going to get fat if you do that. Yes, substances like growth hormone can keep you leaner and anabolics can increase your metabolic rate, but it doesn't really actually change your metabolic rate that much. You can eat like an asset and still end up like an asset, or you can eat a massive amount amount of food in a clean manner and still not really develop any new muscle tissue. It's more just about strategically the fact that steroids make you grow muscle independently of food being there or not, of resistance training being there or not. But hitting gear or growth hormone doesn't just give you the green light to start eating 5,000 calories like your favorite bodybuilder and slamming back thousands of grams of carbohydrates. And I would actually, on top of this, argue that using steroids shouldn't actually fundamentally train, change the way that you're training. It's basically 
basically going to be the same thing. You don't turn into a superhuman. You don't develop this ability to suddenly just control way more volume. Yes, you recover faster, but ultimately all that means for you is that over time you'll be able to create more load or resistance on your muscles, which, which leads to more growth. So while many people, including myself, might agree that you recover faster as an enhanced lifter, it's not really that you need to train any more or any more intense even to get equivalent results as you would have naturally or quicker results. Independently, again, steroids make you grow lean muscle mass without diet considerations or without resistance training. But Dan goes on to take it a step further, suggesting that steroids have been romanticized into these drugs that instantaneously turn you into the next Mr. Olympia by sticking a needle in it, but continuing to argue that this is grossly untrue and that your diet and training still play a massive role. And look, at face value, what I said earlier, this is a statement that does hold up. Steroids aren't going to make up for poor training, steroids aren't going to make up for a poor diet, but just putting the blame on your diet training is kind of bullshit anyways. The steroids, again, independently make you grow lean muscle mass. If you just laid in the bed all day, which there has been studies done on this many, many times, and you give someone 600 milligrams of testosterone, they're going to grow exponentially. It just happens. It almost expands your margin of error within training and diet, right? So in your natural, you have like a 10% margin of error. And if you fall outside of that, you're not going to grow any lean mass. If you take gear, you have a 60% margin of error, which makes it so much easier to make progress, even if you're doing things horribly wrong. But if we continue reading his article here, it seems that we hit with a massive dose of fucking disappointment because he actually doesn't tell us anything about steroids and uh, because the best advice he can give us is follow a good diet but the whole point i clicked on the article which was the title of the article is i want to know how to fuck to use steroids but thankfully for us dan's not just a gatekeeper he just puts things behind a paywall because he actually has a book labeled the ultimate guide to roids clocking in at 109 pages long where he allegedly gives us the bodybuilding truth claiming that this is the number one book you'll ever read on steroids and i could really go through this whole book and dismantle everything but what we really need to understand here is that this is another person a bodybuilder in thailand making a living trying to sell a dream whether that's an e-commerce dream a bodybuilding dream or something else like traveling the world by doing what you love he is making money profiting off other people's i'll be honest lesser intelligence because a lot of the material in the book is just completely false and he's truly scamming his fans out of tens of thousands of dollars by promoting his book as being one of the most useful resources in bodybuilding, meanwhile having a pretty shite physique himself. I mean, the guy hasn't even shared a single comparison photo of him or clients or anyone who's actually used this thing, and his channel, as well as his intellectualism, seems to only come from the people he's spoken to. So as you read through this book, it becomes very clear that a lot of the information isn't actually relevant clinical data, unlike other people who produce content here. It is just bro lore that he's embellishing and trying to sell to you as an idea that it is the way compared to other options, which is highly dangerous. And yes, you can buy the book and read it and maybe learn a thing or two, but you could also just watch free content on YouTube and get much, much better amplitude of information that is actually accurate compared to what he is putting out. And it seems that this book is just the means of how he's able to stay in a foreign country or travel around the world because he's made several thousand dollars off of it. So Dan, the bodybuilder in Thailand, is someone that I used to follow when I was young and getting into bodybuilding and thought his podcasts were quite interesting because he did expose the truth behind what people are really using, which is a lot higher than often people do tend to think. But this was soon met with the realization that I was following somewhat of a maniac, someone who couldn't really control their own thoughts and promotions to this world. They started to claim things that were sort of just outlandish. And it's this reason that I believe Dan is one of those people, archetypes that you should look out for within the fitness industry that sells you an idea that is so great it almost sounds untrue. All the meanwhile, he's just trying to fund his own lifestyle. There's my little bit of lore story for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe. I am out.